for slowing down in participation. So I'm going to go and get started. As Jasmine said, my name is John Gillum. I am a broker in Colorado and New Mexico. I am also a real estate instructor around the country. I work with about 40 associations, realtor associations around the country, and I teach about 140 classes a year. Uh, and so I have anywhere from seven to 10,000 real estate brokers uh, in, in front of me on an annual basis. Most of my classes are geared towards contracts, negotiations, disclosures, and inspections. And I've also worked with InterNACHI and with Ben and these guys for several years on this conversation and this topic and working with brokers. And I have a few classes that we have approved with, uh, through InterNACHI for brokers when it comes to inspections and disclosures. And one of the things I was trying to help people remember is that the inspection side of the real estate transaction is still fairly new and it's still changing in a lot of states. Uh, and I say new, meaning like within the last 40 years, prior to that, uh, we actually didn't have a lot of inspections in a majority of real estate transactions. So there's still a lot that's changing in this industry that we're trying to come around. And as technology has changed uh, and we have more tools coming in, obviously that's changing how all of us have to do business, especially in this last year in 2020 with COVID. I think that this has modified and really forced a lot of us to have to look at changing up how we presented our information and how we did our jobs. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So um, now, so with that, let's go ahead and get into our slideshow. And if you guys have questions as we go, you can jump them into the chat box or you're welcome to just go ahead and uh, speak out during the class. Let me just get our chat pulled up. So again, what we're going to be focusing on today is network building uh, when we're talking about developing relationships with brokers. The focus that we're going to have today is really separating you out from your competition, making sure that you're uh, standing out. And that's really going to start with your first impression uh, and what we're doing to separate you from your competition. I'll also really want to make sure that um, when we're doing that, that we're focusing on doing it based on what you do, what separates you, rather than trying to look at what other folks do. So even though we're, uh, you guys need to be aware of what your competition does, uh, we don't want to reference the specific companies or other people specifically. So, um, and then we also want to really make sure that we're, we're doing what we can to establish your brand for yourself. A lot of you guys work with companies. Uh, we want to make sure that you understand how to leverage the power of those brand recognitions, especially with uh, the backing of InterNACHI and being able to tie in what that means for a lot of inspectors and bro or for a lot of brokers and customers. I know when I'm looking at referrals uh, and, and working in different areas, one of my first questions is, is the inspector a member of InterNACHI? So that's always going to be an important aspect for us. So uh, when you're setting your first impressions, again, one of the things to think about is what is it that you're trying to convey when you're putting out there? Um, you know, there, and, there, and there is that aspect of um, just, well, it, I'll, I'll use me as a case in point. When I came in today, one of the first things I spoke about was sort of setting what my background was, the number of classes I do, the people I talk to, the folks I'm in front of, uh, what my, you know, and what my experience is that that brings me to be in front of you guys. So when you guys are having those conversations, you only have 30 seconds in front of a group of brokers or in front of a single broker, you know, just for a quick meeting, being able to have that conversation to where you're very quickly laying out what you do and what kind of services you have can be really good um, in, in getting that set up. So as we're going, I'm just going to touch check in with our questions really quick. So and yeah, building referrals is absolutely all about relationships and rapport. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a lot about using technology during the COVID time because a lot of brokerage offices are closed, a lot of them are open, but being able to access and get in and use social media sites or Snapchat, uh, Facebook Live, things like that to make sure that you're still in front of people. And you're going to see a lot of the more successful inspectors that we're seeing today are leveraging a lot of those tools. So... Sorry, I'm just reading through the questions really quick. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to kind of get to is when we look at this aspect, um, one of the folks was asking, um, 
about brokers having their inspection company. And that's one of the things that we're actually trying to get brokers to move away from to avoid any. Uh, so we have to work under this uh, federal law called RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, which really is forcing us to not have kickbacks relationships or, or that my, my inspector sort of thing and really uh, trying to push more for the freedom of choice. And that freedom of choice really from our perspective should be based on providing the resource of what you guys can offer. So, um, but let's, let's, let's go and continue with this. And I, like I said, I'll try to keep going with the, the chats as we go up. Knowing your market sources is gonna be really important. Uh, and again, we're here for the conversation today of really diving into working with brokers, but we're gonna also talk about what you guys can do to build your market with buyers and sellers directly, as well as with title and escrow companies. I know in a lot of states, it will end up being the title and escrow company that will coordinate and work with the inspector directly. And knowing that in a lot of markets, 40% of our transactions don't go through realtors, uh, what that means is that a lot of buyers and sellers are looking for those resources and you might have an untapped potential when you go to the escrow department when the buyers are trying to see who they should be looking for to get their inspections done. And then again, working through your social media aspects. So again, I want to really dive into the broker's role and what our responsibility is so that we can also look at how that ties into where you guys are. As brokers, we have an absolute obligation to disclose what we know and typically what we know is either going to be from previous experience or what we see. When I'm doing a walkthrough, if I flag certain things, I'm not going to talk about what's causing it, what's behind it, much like you guys try to uh, have people get further information. But it's something I usually push off to have you guys take a look at so that you can give some better direction for us because that's really not my lane. So if I see cracking in the facade, if I see cracking in the house, if I see discolorations or anything like that, I'm gonna really wanna to try to make sure that we have that as a list, maybe take pictures, um, as well as gather the seller's property disclosure that we get from the seller and provide that to the inspector so the inspector has a good idea about what we have coming into the transaction. What a lot of brokers do, and I want you guys to really sort of to, to grasp a hold of this, what a lot of brokers do when we get our inspections is they're trying to use the inspector as a free resource for numbers. Um, or the brokers are trying to pull numbers out of some magic orifice to figure out how to negotiate through this process. And it really creates a lot of liability because that's not what our specialty is, not our expertise. And right now in this changing time, especially with, with uh, product charges changing and services taking longer, you know, I think brokers can really create a lot of liability for themselves when we're trying to be the ones negotiating out values rather than getting bids. And so I think building that relationship with a inspector, with an inspector who has contractors, electricians, plumbers, and people that you guys trust that you don't have a biased relationship with um, as far as like being a part of that company is something that's gonna really build a lot of trust and help me do a better job for my, for my consumer so that we can get those people in quickly. We're in a time where we're struggling trying to get inspectors out timely. And sometimes in some of my markets, um, we have inspectors that are a month out. So when I can find somebody who can go in quickly, they're typically going to be the one who's going to get the job um, and be able to do that. But then we struggle with being able to have roofers and plumbers and things like that um, that are coming into. So, um, and Phil, I know your, your concern is, is about not referring anybody. And I'm not talking about making referrals, just like I don't make referrals. But what I will do is I'll have a list of resources that are available so that we can try to make sure that our clients have as much options as possible when we're trying to make sure that we can have the contractors, the other people come in to do the follow-up. Because typically in residential real estate, which is different than commercial, we're in a very compressed time frame. One of the biggest struggles we have is working within that like 10 day to 14 day time frame to get all of our inspection work done. It's not like a commercial deal where I have two, three, four, five, six for my, for my phase inspections to get this done. I've got to work through this quickly. And so we have to be as timely as possible and having a list of resources uh, is really important. Again, that's why I also say not having groups that you work with that you're tied to. I think that referral within the side of it, um, it can, can create a huge amount of liability. So um, and, and I, and Phil, I fully agree with you. We should, we actually should be writing out longer offers. And I think that's a better way of doing it, um, in, in our contracts. Unfortunately, we're in a lot of sellers markets where the sellers and a lot of brokers don't understand that. And sellers are pushing for those very quick timeframes. 
So uh, we'll get back into some of these questions in just a second. But again, I want you guys to, to realize from our perspective as brokers, it is this ignorance on our part that leads to a lot of the problems. We're used to doing things the way that we've always done it and trying to work within very short timeframes. I'm being very blunt here as a broker. So when I'm looking at that, I need you guys to realize that we're looking at you as our catch-all. You guys are the ones who are saying, okay, they're going to find everything and they're going to help our people to know what to, to negotiate when we all know that that's, that's not really the reality of it. And we need to have your reports to really fine tune to know who else we need to bring in. Um, but a lot of times that conversation is missed. And so having you engage in there is really, really important. Um, so yeah, in Colorado, and actually not just Colorado, most states I work with, um, there is a huge waiting list for inspectors. So like I said, it can take three to four weeks in a lot of our markets to just to get the initial inspection and then trying to work with getting other people out there. So to, to do the follow-ups. Um, so Michael, the, the, the problem with talking about the best one is we're not qualified to know who the best is. And I will also be really blunt. I've had a lot of inspectors who two years ago, three years ago, might've been the best at what they did in our community. But if they're not keeping up with tools, if they're not keeping up with trainings, they're not keeping up with the changes, then I don't know if they're really the best. And one of the things, again, under federal law is that we are supposed to have a freedom of choice for our clients. So the best way for us to do that is for you guys to tell us what your qualifications are. When I'm referring people out there, and again, I'm gonna get into this, um, I'm looking at what services you provide, what your experiences are, what your uh, certifications are, and what uh, tools you have so that I can make sure that my clients are getting a really good choice and then they, compare, they can compare the cost of the service versus what they're getting for that. I'm one of the few brokers that really wants as much diligence as possible when we get into there. So again, the last couple of days I did a survey uh, with brokers around the country, and the questions I asked are, what are things that inspectors do that have you want to make sure that they're on their list and what inspectors do that you don't like that might push them away? And so I, I just want to go through this with you guys so you can see this. So one of them is that aspect of staying in your lane. Um, and a part of that comes because we've had a lot of, uh, just like you guys get frustrated with brokers jumping over and trying to be inspectors and dissuading what you're talking about. We have the other side where a lot of inspectors do a lot of transactions and they're jumping over and saying, well, I think you should try to negotiate this or you should negotiate that when they're not as involved in the negotiation aspect or the marketing side of it to know what the market is doing at that point. Another big part is using the report and using your walkthrough and summary um, to, to educate the consumer about really what's going on, um, where things fall, looking at the, at, um, you know, like, Obviously, we know like having water build up along foundations and why it's important to have the water pushed away. So rather than the, the doom and gloom perspective, it's more of the education side of what we can do to remedy it and then have it be improved in the future. Being on time, uh, being prepared. And then we're going to talk about this in the dislikes also. One of the issues that a lot of brokers have is having an inspector come out and missing the whole inspection for the attic because they didn't bring a ladder um, or they assume that there would be a ladder access for the attic <clears throat> uh, or not being prepared to have you know the, the the appropriate clothes to go in the crawl space and so they're just missing large portions of the inspection as a whole um, having really good photos that's that's going to be a good one having really good quality photos and videos uh, we have a lot of inspectors that are still using like an iphone four or five or really old quality uh, or old technology um, and actually using handwritten reports. And so that's one of those things that is also, it, it, just, it just sort of hurts your professionalism and it helps uh, and it doesn't help when we're trying to deal with it. Timely reporting. I know most of you guys right now are using reporting systems that as soon as you upload it uh, into yours, it's going into the system. And when you close it out and you have them sign off on the inspection and pay for it, it immediately kicks it over to them. That's a great tool to have. If you guys are taking two, three, four, five days to get the inspections out, you're pushing a lot of these deals past the inspection period that we have in our contracts. And then the buyers are, are losing out on their opportunity to even address that when they're going through there. So um, having really good, clear summaries, breaking down the different levels of things so that we, we really understand, like, is this just a simple deferred maintenance issue? Is it something that can be fixed through, um, you know, through a, through a fairly simple means? Is it a serious issue? Um, or is it something that, that even, you know, again, I know you guys always recommend further investigation of stuff. 
Um, but really being able to clarify those areas so that our, our consumers really know when we need to be taking a more serious action to move forward in that. Um, also clarifying the difference between deferred maintenance and defects is important. I've had a lot, I've actually had a lot of my consumers that have walked away from transactions and the inspector was looked at poorly by the brokers in the transaction because they were talking about maintenance issues and really overplaying the maintenance issues rather than focusing on these are the defects and here's a maintenance schedule um, of, of things that you should be looking at or to be aware of when you're moving forward with the house. Uh, another thing that we're seeing change in a lot of states is we wanna make sure that you guys should actually send the information to the consumer. As the broker, I'm not your consumer and I'll be honest with you, I don't have the skill set and knowledge that you guys do to even walk through the inspection with my clients. I know a lot of brokers do that, but I'll be honest, that is beyond our scope of expertise and, and it's probably not appropriate for the broker to be the one walking through there. So having that relationship with you guys to, have, to be able to do that is going to be really, really key for me and how we stru uh, structure that going through the process is going to be really important. So uh, some inspectors say that short reports and summaries are best for the clients, not scare them off. Um, so David, I, 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 I like there being a combination. So what David was saying is that um, some inspectors are hearing back from brokers that they really just send, should send a summary over. And what I find is for consumers and for negotiations and we're going through there, um, what, what really helps is when I have a really good clear summary and then having the rest of the information with the more detailed aspect in the report. So I actually really like it when my consumers have both so when they're trying to get further information by having the contractor come out there, it's very clear to the contractor what's going on and what they should be focusing on. Um, so it's, it's good to have both of those. Uh, Roy, so you wanna clarify the issue between a defect and maintenance. Um, so you know, like having, um, when you're looking at siding and different, different forms of siding and looking at the, the ongoing maintenance and, and talking with them about a maintenance schedule for those things, um, and letting them know, like, this is something that you should be taking care of on a regular basis to avoid having uh, future actual defects. Like if I've got hardy plank and they're not being sealed, or if I've got stucco and we're getting, you know, water penetration, anything like that. If the consumers know why it's important to keep up with the deferred maintenance, and we're going to talk about that as another business line for you guys in a second, um, then it helps them to make sure that, that they know what they should be doing. Um, but we've had some folks where they flag that as being, like uh, sort of played it up as a major issue because it was one of the only things that they could find um, rather than letting them know like this is a maintenance side of things, not a defect of, you know, we need to bring in compaction, we need to bring in dirt or we've got to do testing for X, Y, and Z. So, so things like that. Um, yeah, thank you, James. <laughs> Defects are the ones that, that, that typically like are going to be bigger issues later. But again, what I always teach is, is a lack of maintenance is what also will lead to much larger defects in the future. So um, Brad, you bring up things like that. Um, yeah, bad bulbs, the, the little small things are the things that just, they, they make those longer. It's important to have them there, but yeah, talking more about the, uh, the stove pipe being too close to what are combustibles or um, dealing with fire hazards, those, those are really, really critical aspects that we should be focusing on. The things that brokers don't like, uh, again, is, is telling consumers what to negotiate without actual bids, um, speaking without having tests. I can't tell you guys how many times I've been walking through a property and had the inspector use the M word, like actually say, well, I found mold in this area um, when, again, I know almost all of you guys know that when we're using that word, especially for us, it's not something we should be using because in some areas, as a broker, if I were to clarify mold, the assumption is black mold. And rather than, you know, discoloration or growth or my, uh, um, all the different ways that we can reference it in our inspections. But if I were to use that term specifically, just like, like if I were to say settlement crack without qualifying that it actually was from settling rather than workmanship, I can actually get tagged for slander um, and be held accountable for that. So I'm also looking for you guys to be very careful not to say something like that unless we have the tests in there as well. Um, missing things due to, due to distractions. I, I know it's tough. I know 10% of you guys are perfectly fine with having consumers with you. As a broker, my preference is not to have my consumers with you until you're done. I don't wanna follow you around. I don't like people being around you guys. I want you to be able to focus on your job, really stay clear and concise 
And then at the end of it, you know, for the last 30 minutes or whatever, have the consumers do a walkthrough or in today's world, have you guys do a virtual walkthrough after you've seen everything and you have your summary reported on there. So, um, and, and Roy doesn't need to be an emphasis on maintenance, but just making sure that we understand what the future might be um, and, and, and clarifying that it's, that it's not the same as a defect. So yeah, um, we already talked about that. Uh, having having handwritten reports, um, we've had a lot of a lot of this is surprising. A lot of our brokers came back and said that the inspectors broke something uh, and didn't say anything. Um, and then also sending your reports to the listing broker, which we're having a lot of states where that could actually create a, a violation between the buyer and the seller if the report is given to the seller without the seller's permission. So we're not supposed to do that. So we need to make sure that the inspectors aren't sending that. And honestly, that's not in your best interest when it comes to protecting your intellectual property. So again, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, and then the last one is having you guys speak to the brokers during the walkthrough or addressing things to the broker rather than to the consumer. We always wanna make sure that the buyer, the seller, whoever that we're working with, that that's who you're speaking directly to. And, we want, and as brokers, we wanna make sure that you're the one that we're looking at as the expert in the field, not having them come to look to us for questions on this. Uh, so we've already talked about this. Um, and, and one of the areas where you guys can really support us is we have an obligation to disclose dis, uh, material defects that we see. So ethically, um, as realtors, we have an, a, a code of ethics we have to follow. Legally, in all states, we have an obligation to disclose any material defects that we see. But I think it's important for you guys to come in and meet with us. If you're coming into a brokerage office and if you wanna do a training, don't just talk about what you do and what makes you awesome. Maybe do a section on like explaining why you flag certain things, what material defects are, and why it's important for them to be disclosed to the consumer and ways to do it. Like if you guys can teach brokers to do a better job of not saying really stupid stuff as we go through there, um, like I said before, like teaching us not to say, uh, well, it's a settlement issue, uh, it's a settlement cracks, or that's a structural issue when it might not be um, what we think it is. So we're even teaching us not to say the M word um, or pulling numbers out of magic orifice. Like if you guys can do a, a, you know, do a better job of educating us, then we do a better job of what we disclose and passing our consumers on to a much more qualified person when we're doing that. Uh, so Ramon, I know that uh, a lot of realtors like to be in the middle, uh, like to be the middle man. And this is an education thing that we're trying to push with brokers nationally to get them to understand that we really need to stay in our lanes. Again, this is a newer thing for us. For many, many years, we were the ones who sort of stepped in the middle. We marked property corners. We walked through the title work. We read through the inspections because we thought we had to do everything for our consumers. And now what we're finding is that we do a much better job when we can direct our consumers to an expert to a, to a more qualified person. So again, that's a part of the education aspect that you can help us with um, when, when we're doing this to help brokers understand that it's actually gonna be better uh, to, to have our consumers get passed on to a more qualified person other than the broker. And even when brokers were, were builders in previous lives, I'm, I'm sorry, but just because I have 15 or 20 years experience as a builder doesn't mean I have any knowledge of what this year's code is or of what the pricing for what things are today. So again, we should be really make sure that we're, we're passing that on to other folks. Um, and again, I say this and I wanna make sure that you guys understand our liability for disclosure and why we look to you guys so much because that is our number one lawsuit. The thing that we as brokers get sued for the most is lack of disclosure. And the two things that lead to that is not knowing what is and is not a proper disclosure to disclose and not putting it in writing. So you guys working with us on, hey, here's something that we do and why we word and why we phrase things and why we put it in writing or why we take pictures of it to protect the consumer is a great way for you as brokers to be able to make sure that you're flagging it and then having it identified so that we can send it to you guys. But it also proves that we made our disclosures the right way. Um, and again, Educating us on the use of inspections is really, really, really important. We've got to really focus on the fact that inspections are not supposed to be something that we should be using as hard facts to negotiate from, but rather looking at it more of like a phase one to a phase two. Uh, you know, in all of you guys that do environmental work or phase inspections, I know you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but we need to really get people to understand that the, the, the 
the general home inspection is just that it's a generalist view of the property. And then we should be doing secondary or phase two inspections of the more specific areas to bring in those specialists to look specifically at that. And so again, when we're talking about cost of inspections and what we're doing, you know, rather than being the broker who's going to tell people, and again, you can educate us rather than brokers saying, oh, an inspection is going to be 450 or 550 or 650, prepare the consumers up front and tell them that a consumer should expect to spend a thousand, fifteen hundred, you know, or more, depending on how much they're willing to spend as a part of their due diligence to make themselves satisfied with the property. We want buyers today having the knowledge of what they're getting into. So that's going to be a really important aspect. But again, that's a change of mindset. And I know a lot of brokers are going to struggle with that, but it's something that we're, we're being pushed to do. So if you guys can be on the forefront of that, it's going to make a big difference for us moving forward. So if you want, again, as we're doing this, if you want to be on that referral list and with that referral process, um, then help us overcome the concerns that we have when we're out there, which is, you know, again, what is your level of competency? If you've been doing inspections for 30 years, but you're not using IR, um, you're, you're using handwritten reports and things like that, um, you might have a good long base of business, but that's going to start shifting away pretty quickly and we start missing things. So keeping up with it and really maintaining your level of competency in education is going to be huge for us as we go through um, in, into the future. Because one of the things that happens is if I give my consumer your name and something is missed on a large basis, I can actually be sued for negligent referral. Um, now with InterNACHI, one of the reasons why I like working with InterNACHI is they actually provide a $10,000 indemnification to, to you guys to protect the brokers who refer you from that instance. Um, and a lot, of other, a lot of other inspection companies don't have that. So that's something that makes me feel better that you're gonna do a good job and that you're backed. Um, and then the other part of that is if something is missed or if we go through, if I miss a disclosure item because I didn't understand it, what is that follow-up investigation and how long can that happen? Well, in a lot of states, we as brokers can actually be sued 15, 20 years down the line based on our licensure, where in the states where you guys aren't licensed, there's almost no liability. So that's a huge concern for us because when it comes to non-disclosure or missing something, the statute of frauds in a lot of states is three years from the point of discovery. So if the buyer buys the property in 2000, but they don't sell it until 2015, and they discover something at that point that damages the value of the property that they feel would have been evident at this point, we actually still get complaints going back 15 years uh, in, into the past. Uh, so Roger, what are the pros and cons of pre-listing inspection? How often does a broker choose to have a pre-listing inspection? Um, if you can just give me a second on that, we're actually gonna jump into that uh, in just a minute with our conversation here. So I've got a slide for that. So again, for you guys looking at your resources to help us as brokers feel more confident, again, the $10,000 um, uh, negligent referral indemnification is, is pretty big. Uh, InterNACHI actually has a buyback program. If something large is missed and there's a major problem, InterNACHI will actually repurchase the home, correct the issue, and then list it with the broker that referred the inspector over there. So that's, that's sort of a big thing. Um, if you guys are, aren't using the book, now that you've had your inspection, uh, that's actually a great resource. I provide that to almost all of my buyers so that they understand a lot of those deferred maintenance issues. So you guys have a lot of resources that are available to you. We just got to learn to use them um, a bit more effectively. So uh, working hey, with buyers John, again. Yes. Really quick. I have a question here from Ramon. He was wanting to know um, some brokers have referral programs. In a nutshell, the inspector pays $500 a year to be in the list of three. Not all offices do this, but many in my area do. Is this considered a conflict of interest? So Ramon, I'm going to tell you that in most states, uh, and even from an ethical perspective. And, and when I say ethics, that is only for realtors, which 40% of licensees are not realtors. But as realtors, and in the states that have uh, what's called an affiliated business arrangement, we are not allowed to charge um, or to get kickbacks or benefits for having somebody on a list like that. Uh, so yeah, that, that, is, that is in most areas, that's actually not appropriate. Now that's different than paying a marketing fee to be on a website or to be marketed or something like that. That's, that's different. 
um, it's, it's, it, that's a very different aspect. Again, paying for marketing to be on a website is different than, than paying to be on my list of three. So I want to I want to clarify that there is a difference in those two things. So, um, and thank you, Phyllis. Uh, so again, using the buyer and I, I, we already talked about this um, on the buyer inspections, really making sure that that we're also putting everything in writing. One of the things that gets really hard when I'm working with the buyer and trying to send something off for them to get further investigation is when you're doing your walkthrough and you verbalize something, and it's not on your report and it didn't get put into your, into your system. And that's why, again, my preference is to have you guys finalize your report, get everything set up, have your summary done, so that when the buyer walks through, you're walking through what they're going to see uh, in the report. So, and, and we don't miss things on the verbal side of it. So uh, going to Roger's question about pre-inspections. So uh, it's kind of funny you had that. So when we're talking about the, the pros and cons, and this is going to, is going to be impacted differently in different states. Um, we have some states that in the last two years had shifted into a very strong pre-inspection process because of the market. When you're in a, in a market where you're getting literally 40, 50, 60 offers, um, in Seattle, I had one of my students had 153 offers on a house. And to combat those deals falling through, what was happening was they were having sellers get pre-inspections and then providing that to the buyer to have as a part of the process. And then that was supposed to satisfy the buyer for their inspection issues. The problem with that is by, again, the buyer not having the freedom to pick their inspector to get their discovery of the property, then if anything was missed by that inspector for the seller's pre-inspection that the seller may have had knowledge of, because the buyer bought it subject to that level of knowledge, uh, the seller and the broker may still have been on the hook for things that they had knowledge of that wasn't dis that that wasn't disclosed. So there is a huge danger to seller provided pre inspections if they're not giving the buyer the opportunity. Now I do think that in those markets having a seller generated pre inspection is a great tool to know what we have to deal with to fix the items up front. Um, and really, what I look at with those is I tell my people let's let's get the inspection done and then bring in the contractors to address the items and then be able to provide a list of what was not an issue that didn't need to be fixed and to address the things that were. And then I use it as a marketing tool moving forward to say, look, all of these things have been done um, and, and shifting forward that way. We also see a lot of that for sellers in a buyer's market when we're trying to separate the property apart. So there's definitely a market for that. It's understanding how that tool works between the buyer's market and the seller's market and how that gets played off. Pre-inspections for buyers is a different tool. So in a lot of those markets, what they're doing is they're giving buyers a four, five, six day time frame before they will accept offers to allow buyers to get pre-inspections of the properties, which is awesome for you guys because you'll have one home that might end up having five, 10, 15 inspections. And as an inspector, you might be able to pick up two or three of those for the different buyers. So that's something that in, in like in Seattle, that was a really big thing for a couple of years, those buyers having the opportunity to have the property inspected prior to making the offer so that they would have that knowledge when they went forward. Um, again, the danger in that is you're getting the inspection, the buyer has a general sense of what's wrong, but not really any of the specifics that would have come up had they brought in the roof or the plumber, the electrician, the structural engineer, um, the soils person or any of those things. So. That, again, there's always some liability that comes up when we force the issue to go too quickly and back to, and I, I apologize for remembering who said it, um, but back to their point of that really falling on us and the buyers and sellers for not giving adequate time to really delve into and to address those things appropriately. I agree with that. And it is something that we are trying to shift our industry to do a better job of. And you guys providing our education to say why that's important is, is again, it's going to be really uh, a really key thing. Uh, Pre-inspection is dangerous for the inspector as well. We get calls for houses. Uh, we inspected pre-listing um, only months after the pre-listing. So yeah, Brad, I 100% I, uh, agree with that. And that's also why as a, as a broker, I don't like getting the inspection that the buyer did even a week ago to then have to pass on to a new buyer because inspectors see different things. Um, things in the home can, can change even in that one week time frame. 
Uh, and so 100%. So that's why it's also really important that I've seen a lot of inspectors going to a cover sheet that says this inspection was only valid as of this date, things may have changed and almost having a disclaimer at the very beginning of it. Um, and, and, and it's the same thing for brokers. We go through houses we're like, wow, this is a sweet house. And I go through the second time and I'm like, okay, no, this is lipstick on a pig and it's a giant turd of a house. So all of that really comes into play for, for all of us. Uh, so John, it's important to, uh, uh, is it appropriate or expected for inspectors to provide money estimates for repair if there's no time for specialists? I get asked, uh, so John, I know that you guys get asked that a lot. Um, I struggle with that. I actually don't really believe it's always a, appropriate for you guys to do that. There's, there's bid software that you guys can use. Um, at least it's something that's coming from an outside person, not from, not from you guys. And again, the danger is there is like right now, if you are going off of numbers from six months ago on what you are getting bids for, um, then that would not apply today because we're seeing supply chains and costs and things like that for materials skyrocket in a lot of our markets. And so those numbers may not apply and we could be damaging the buyer or the seller when we're using numbers that are out of date in the negotiations on how they want to fix that. So again, just this, this is why it's really important that we're always keeping up with things currently with what's going on. And that includes your inspections. I don't want a two week old inspection. I want an inspection from today. So um, and then the other part of that with the sellers is anything that does come up on that inspection that the, that the seller or the broker gets is a part of our level of knowledge. And the problem that we have is when we get them in inspections, those are usually considered potential defects because we don't know the level of defect that exists until we have the specialist come in to actually provide a report. If you see something with a truss in an attic, I don't know if it's truly a structural issue until we have the engineer come in and give the evaluation. If we see a discoloration, I don't know if it's mold until we have the report on it. Um, but as a broker and a seller, that adds to our liability for disclosure or not disclosure as we're moving forward. So uh, yeah, Gary, you guys are right. There. And again, this is where you guys going to your vendor section after this is a huge resource because a lot of these are systems that you can use um, that the software can build into it. So Scott, uh, providing estimates creates bias. So I don't, I, and, and uh, Scott, to that point, in a lot of states, if you are a contractor and an inspector, you can't do one in the same. One of my biggest frustrations in a state like New Mexico, where we have to have septic inspections is the person doing the inspection is also the one who wants to do the work. Do you wanna know what percentage of my septics fail? Yeah, there, there, there's a huge amount of bias and that creates a huge lack of trust um, and lack of professionalism when that gets to be a pattern that we see happening on a, on a pretty regular basis. So I definitely um, appreciate that perspective in there. Um, in those cases where I said, where the listing broker has received your inspection, so the buyer got it done, the buyer broker got it done, and then the listing broker suddenly gets it either because they're negotiating, they've asked for it. I need you guys to really be clear and, and understand your own agreements. When you read through your agreement with the buyer, it says that this is only to be used for that person for that transaction. So it's really good for you guys to go further and say, this is not something that should be shared with the listing broker without my permission. If you want to have parts of it shared with the listing broker, please let me know. Um, and then and we can talk about that because what you're doing is you guys are losing the value of your intellectual property. When you create a report, that's a copyrighted document. It's your pictures, it's your report, it's your knowledge. And I don't think it's fair for you guys to do all the work to create that and then have it passed on to another buyer who then uses it for their negotiation when it's not current. It creates liabilities for both you and us. Um, you know, and, and, and again, and, and when they're sharing that information out there, you're losing the value of your product. So I want you guys to really be looking at educating us on the copyright violations that come up when we're doing that and, and what happens. Uh, so um, some aspects of selling your, yes. To interrupt you really quick, we have yeah. a couple questions that popped through while you were talking before. And um, I just wanted to run through them with you really quick. The first one is from James. Um, and now he posted this a little while ago, but he was asking some home inspectors are also general contractors. Do you see issues with double tapping? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. If you're a contractor and an inspector, um, I, I, and again, we're seeing more and more states adopting the fact that if you have both licenses, you cannot do both. You can't provide the inspection and then do the bids. Where this, I will also take a step back and where this is tougher is I have, you know, I'm in a market with a lot of older homes and especially in, in a resort market. And a lot of our buyers that we work with actually want to bring in the inspector to get bids for work or not, I'm sorry, not the inspector, the contractor to get the bids for the work. And I think those are two different things. I believe that there's a difference between an inspector who's identifying things, who's then saying, and I can fix it for this much money versus me bringing in the contractor to do a rehab or a remodel and having the numbers from that. Those are two very different perspectives. So uh, in reference to the intellectual property, do you work with Nachi InterNACHI to include these items in their boilerplate inspections? Um, yeah, so honestly, when you create, anytime that you guys are using a boilerplate inspection, um, it's still your photos. It's still your information. So anything that's in there is still yours. And if you actually read through, I, be, I believe, if, and, and, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that the InterNACHI, that, uh, well, let me go back, their report and their agreement, and I believe a lot of the software that you guys use, if you actually read through the agreement with the buyer, it actually clarifies that the inspection is owned by you, not the buyer. And that's a misunderstanding and a miscommunication that most brokers have and most buyers have where they believe that the buyer owns it. And in some cases, they actually believe that the buyer can resell that to the next buyer. So that's a really big uh, or important aspect of you guys understanding your documents and what it says so that you can have that conversation and really clarify, this is a protected aspect. It is intellectual property um, and that it really only should be used for something specific. And, and that is a part of, of what they have in there already. Um, so. Yeah, so it looks like we have another one here from John. What if you have someone else at your contracting company do the work while, you, while you're doing the inspecting? Is this still double dipping? So much like we have to do, if, if as a broker, if I have any relationship whatsoever to an inspection company, a building company, a lawn company, a title company, whatever, um, what's required for us at a federal level, state level, and an ethical level is a disclosure of the fact that um, I could be receiving benefits. So, and so I think if you're going to have that, just be really clear that there is a benefit coming back to that side of it. So that if there's ever a question in the future that you've made full disclosure of that fact. And I think that that's at least moving a step forward in, um, you know, a, a really professional and ethical aspect of how we work with our buyers. And again, in some states, you cannot do that. You can't do both. So again, knowing the state that you work in is going to be really important with that too. Um, it looks like someone else is asking if that applies to radon or mitig radon mitigation. Uh, yes, yes. Again, same thing. I know a lot of companies can do mold testing, radon testing, water testing, um, soils testing, environmental testing. You know, all those same things. If you're if you're in there picking up and, and doing the testing on that, um, if you're doing the mitigation just be really clear um, and, and again maybe use an independent lab or or have an outside third party to qualify or clarify where the information is coming from and then make yourself available as one of the um, mitigation or remediation companies that they can use for that but again i do think that being really clear and 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 delineating the differences or that there's a benefit to you on that backside is still going to be really important so um, so Bobby, a lot of you guys are saying that, that a lot of you guys have states or other requirements that don't, that simply don't allow you to do it for at least a year. So that, that goes right back to what we were talking about. So, um, I'm trying to get through If I miss your questions, I know I've got Jasmine trying to catch these as well. Yeah, no, it looks like, um, we have another one here. What about home? What about a home inspector also, um, having a real estate license, but not doing an inspection on his own listing? Can that inspector do inspections yeah. for other listing agents with the same broker? Yeah, so Navita, that's a good question. And again, this comes up because we have brokers who are also um, uh, lenders or they might do title work or they might do they might do other things. Um, yeah, and then uh, Daniel, get to the, the separate question in a second. Um, so in those areas, uh, I, I don't think that there's a huge issue with it as long as um, you're in a state where you have designated relationships as the broker. 
So um, a lot of states are shifting to that where the relationship is not with the whole company, but with an individual broker. And if that's the case, then I don't really see the relationship, but I would still disclose the fact that that person works in the office. So again, in the, uh, as an affiliated business arrangement, I would still disclose if I have a, I, in fact, I had a person in our office that had a painting company and I had a few of my clients that engaged them. Ironically, they found them through like other online lists and, and conglomerates, things like that. Um, but as soon as I heard they were working with them, I made the disclosure to say, I want you to know that this is a broker in my office. They're not a part of the transaction. I have no benefit with this. And I need you to always make sure that their work is separate from my work. Because again, as the inspector was a license doing other doing work for other people, if you miss something, that damages the whole company. And so that's one of the reasons why for my brokers, I typically don't want, I don't want brokers that do a lot of different things because I've had issues in the past where somebody missed something or, or had a problem and it, it reflected back on the whole entire company. Uh, so somebody was asking about septic. Um, Daniel, one of the things I think that if you have a sewer line or even a septic line, having it scoped, that's a huge service. But in a lot of states um, that, have, that have septics, whether they're lagoon septics or engineered septics, that's actually becoming a required obligation to have tested and certified through the, um, the, through the health department. You have to be a certified inspector through the health department in order for the property to even be sold. So that's a requirement for transfer of title of the property is to have the actual septic system be tested and evaluated. So they have to have it pumped, back, uh, backflow tested, um, in some cases, they're, they want the system drained so they can recheck for percolation. Um, so there's a lot of things that come up with the septic inspections that are different. And so we're seeing a lot of inspectors that are adding that certification and testing to it, um, but they're not doing the work. So again, there's not a bias in what they do. So uh, jumping back over to the slideshow. Yes, Jasmine. Really, really quick, John. We have a couple more questions that are coming through on the Q&A, and I just wanted to hit a couple of them. Um, so one from Andrew, regarding indemnification or hold, it, hold harmless, if the agent does not party to the inspection contract, how is the clause in our agreement enforceable? The, because what ends up happening in a lot of cases, and, 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 and I want to clarify, are you talking about the aspect of the broker sharing the information and having a liability um, or, or the information that's in it? If it's, if it's the side of the broker sharing that information and us having a liability. Um, it, it, a part of it, again, is I'm not your consumer. I actually asked the inspector se to send it only to my buyer and to have the conversation then for the buyer to come to me and say, these are the five or six things that we need further investigation of. And then I will work with the inspector or I'll work with the consumer in identifying um, other service providers to come in to look at those specific things. Um, because what I don't wanna be on the hook for is me having the whole inspection um, and creating the potential of it getting sent over to their side and creating that, that liability. Um, the other aspect of negligent referral, again, uh, as, as far as the indemnifications and everything go, is if you're the person that I referred and you missed something, um, because I have, typically in most states, brokers have a higher obligation for insurance, what we call an errors and omissions insurance, which I know some of you guys have, but because we have that, we get named. Um, and a lot of states that don't have licensure for inspectors, um, then that doesn't exist on the inspector side. So, the, so we actually have very few complaints and suits against the inspectors. They all come against the brokers because we have that insurance policy and the assumption that we have a lot of money. So they come after us um, for things that the inspector misses. So um, again, when you're selling yourself, some things to keep in mind is make sure that you're presenting your information, not just, um, hey, here's who I am, and, and, but talk about what your background is have a list of your certifications, you know, have a list of what things you're qualified to test, demonstrate the tools that you have that you can actually use. Like, are you an FAA um, certified drone pilot? We have a lot of areas where that's a bigger issue because you either can't get on the roof because of the, of the material, if it's like clay or, um, you know, clay tiles, things like that. Um, you know, we might not be able to actually get onto the roof. And so having the ability of, of having that looked at through drone um, gets to be really important. And using IR, I will be honest with you guys, um, I typically don't uh, include a lot of inspectors on my list if they're not doing IR. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more because um, one of the things that I'm seeing is a lot of inspectors are using the infrared or the flare cameras um, for certain parts of the home, but they're not using it as a general walkthrough through the, 
through the whole home. Like if you can do a 10 minute walk through the whole home um, in almost, I'd say half of the situations where I've had the inspectors use it and, and, and use it for that function, they're finding things that they otherwise would not have had on there. Like we've seen some where they realize that you know, the way that the insulation and, and the pitch of the roof was that the R factor was different. We've had some find, um, and I know you guys are seeing this all, all over the place, but um, where there might have been moisture or something like that, where there was no visible sign of it. And so the inspector never would have flagged it or tested for moisture in the sheetrock had it not come up on the IR. So those are some areas where you guys can do a really good job of helping us to avoid potential liabilities um, or, or find those issues that otherwise wouldn't have come up for weeks or months afterwards. So um, when you're building your business, branding is really important. So consistent branding, if you work with a franchise, consistently use that name, tie it in, make it synonymous with who you are. And this is also one of those areas where if I do five different things, it gets a little tougher to have that really consistent branding because people might forget who I do or, or where I'm at. So being really consistent, leveraging the power of the brands that you guys work for is going to be huge. Creating a, a brand for yourself uh, for recall. And this is, this is something that's actually tested by marketing companies. Recall. Is it aided recall? Is it unaided recall? If I say um, name an inspection company, are you going to be one of the first one or two that come up? That's, that's, that's going to be a really, really key thing. Having A to recall, who is ABC inspection or what is AB, ABC inspection and what are their specialties? That's aided recall. And again, that's really important to make sure that you're there. But what you guys want is the unaided. If I simply say, who is this? You want to be top of mind for that person. How does that happen? Through impressions, being in front of them, always having something to put yourself out there that's in front of that person so that that's consistently who you guys think of. And it's funny, like I actually have, if somebody says, well, who's a good inspector? I have inspectors that I see on social media or that I work with or I engage with that aren't in my market that come to my mind before some of the people in my market. And that's a problem. But what that tells me is that the folks in my market need to do a better job of getting that out there. Um, so Wallace, you're, you're, you're exactly right. The problem with the inspection is not going to find everything. It's a sample. And again, that's that side of uh, the, the generalist. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming in to look for things to see if you can identify things or historical aspects or materials that were used to get their further investigation of. Um, I, I fully agree. It, it, they really shouldn't be uh, destructive or invasive into the property. That's really what the second step is for once we have that. Uh, do I see inspectors charging for iron drone? Um, so Roger, that Yes and no. So what I see is some of them will have a base charge and then they have a menu of services on top of that. And I have other ones where their fees are a bit higher and it's inclusive. So that's fully up to you guys on how you want to structure that for what you're doing. So uh, getting back to the marketing, um, just some general things to, to think about. Um, as you guys can imagine, when I'm if, if I go to the National Inspectors Conference when I was there last year, I think I came back with 150 cards. Um, I'm not going to remember all 150 of you guys. And in my market, I have inspectors that come in two, three times a week and they're bringing in cars and they're bringing in flyers and they're bringing in that stuff. And it's good collateral material. But more times than not, if I were to walk back right now and show you guys our mailroom, there's stacks of information from lenders, inspectors, and different people that are all just sitting back there. The ones that I have that are available are the ones that end up in my phone. If, if I meet you and you immediately text me your contact information, I'm putting your contact in my phone. When I'm out with clients and I need the name of, of an inspector and you're in my phone, you're going to have a much higher chance than the 20 people whose business cards I have sitting in the back of my office with a Tootsie Roll attached to it. So uh, again, what is the effectiveness of what you're doing and how does that play out does become really important. Um, leveraging your web, your web resources. What is your website? How strong is it? How easily can I find you? One of the most frustrating things I have with my consumers is they look you up and your phone number is not immediately available, right? That's going to be the quickest, easiest way for people to get a hold of you. Or even telling them, text me, text me your information and I'll get back to you. I know a lot of you guys are like me and going back and checking voicemails and having 30 voicemails is very time consuming. But having a system to where I can text you or I am you or something like that is a lot more effective and it's going to allow you guys to get back with me a lot quicker. Um, and, and if you haven't, go back, 
um, when you get back from conference or, or when you, I'm sorry, you're not traveling conference, when you guys get back and you have some time, Google yourself, look up your own reviews. Yes, our consumers are absolutely going to Yelp and going to Google review and going to Angie's List and going to all those different places to see what your reviews are. And I have a lot of inspectors that didn't even know that they had reviews out there. So I want you guys to please go back and do that. One of the things that really carries a lot of weight with our consumers is when there's a, you know, a, a review or if something get, got missed is to have you respond to it. Um, and but how you respond to it is also going to have a really big impact in what that happens. Um, so John was saying, I have more in-depth training and background on roof inspections. Can I point out the difference between hail damage versus blistering granule? Uh, so John, if you if you always go back to when it comes to anything that any of us are doing in our services, um, I think that if we sort of look at like the Good Samaritan rule, if you're speaking to the point that you're qualified to speak to or that you have a level of knowledge and experience in, that's going to be a positive thing. I don't think that that you know you having knowledge of, of how that can play um, is, is going to create a liability on, on the broker because I don't have that level of knowledge. So as long as I'm not speaking to it, then, then we're okay. Um, but also clarifying and saying it looks like it could be um, you know granule loss, but it might. But, but again, that that is that because of you know, something being on the roof, did they, you know, was, or was that a, a defect in the material? Um, so again, just making sure that, that what we're, we're doing is really driving them to have other people get more investigation of that, I think is going to be pretty important. So um, we're going to get into the social media lineup in just a second. I just want to touch base on services that I know a lot of you guys offer, but I'm always surprised to find out how many of us don't. And I'm actually going to say a vast majority of inspectors that I talk to around the country do not have a lot of these services in place. So I'm just going to give you guys some extra services that I have found um, that really make a big difference for my consumers. So one of those is new home inspections, not just the first inspection, but doing a three-phase inspection, doing the pre-inspection so we can make sure that the builder you know, did things like connected the vents or connected the sewer. Those are things that we see get missed a lot. But coming back a month later and doing a quick walkthrough and, and having it broken down to say, look, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to retest for fittings, making sure there's not a water leak, making sure there's not a gas leak, and then doing an 11 month inspection because in a lot of states they have a one year implied warranty for builders. And so having the inspector as a part of the, the inspection process also come back at 11 months later. And again, these are upcharges for you guys. So this is building business for you. But having you come back 11 months later before the expiration of the builder's warranty to recheck everything is a great resource for my buyers to feel like when they're getting that new construction that they have some assurances on where things are and where they're going to be in the future. <clears throat> going back to the maintenance, like looking at deferred maintenance versus material defects. Um, I have very few inspectors and, and they're kind of surprised when I will call them and say, hey, you know, I've had these folks, they've been here for four or five years and, you know, they haven't really done anything in the house. Can you come back out and just do a, a, a walkthrough with them and see if you see anything that they could be working on for deferred maintenance issues? Because I want you guys to remember when the buyer is getting a home and you get the inspection, yes, your inspection is really detailed and the follow-up is detailed, but those people are also dealing with loans, gathering all their loan paperwork. They're trying to review you know, 100 pages of HOA documents, they're looking at 40 pages of title documents. It, it, it is a very overwhelming process. And if you've been through the home buying process, you know what I'm talking about. It is very overwhelming. And then they're moving and then they're unpacking and then they're getting stuff put away. And half of what we talk about of these are things you should do after you close is gone. So maybe come back and do a, a three month follow up after closing. Hey, this is a reminder. These were some of the deferred maintenance things that we talked about that you might want to do. Um, and again, maybe offer a service to come back out in a year or two to say, you know, like look at your downspouts, look at your gutters. Here's something that you want to be looking at for where water is pooling. Those are all things that would really be helpful to homeowners. And then we can actually have more people doing a better job of maintaining their properties as we go. And it gives you guys another line of service that you can build up on. Uh, with the COVID-19, uh, I've had a lot of inspectors who have done an amazing job of creating virtual summaries. I've had several people that bought properties sight unseen. And so I had to step up my game to make sure I was doing a better job of showing the property. I had to get new tools. 
<clears throat> so I got more effective in using like a Matterport camera, which does a 3D imaging of the property, very high definition. I upgraded my, my camera system, my phone system, so I could do virtual walkthroughs on a gimbal to have a very still um, picture of the property. And you guys using those same things, using those same tools, so that when you're doing your summary walkthrough, you can walk through, have it very, very clear, have a really good high quality camera on your phone using the gimbal so it's a nice still shot and not jostled around and bouncing around, which, which just gets confusing. Um, and then uploading that so that the buyer has that video summary that they can refer back to later, um, which again, five years from now, when a problem comes up, if we have that video upload, it's very clear exactly what you said to the consumer. And there's no, I thought they said this. It's there, it's documented, we're all protected a lot better. Um, also doing a lot more uploaded video content for homeowners. When you're looking at deferred maintenance issues or if you find uh, issues with a property that maybe sellers can jump on early, do a 30 second or a one minute video and upload it to your YouTube channel or put it on your Facebook Live or put it on, again, whatever social media content that you're using, the more that you put that out there, A, it's an impression for me, I'm seeing you on a more frequent basis, right? But it's something that I can send to my homeowners, even have my homeowners and my clients use for them to look at what they're doing. But that also then for that consumer puts you first of mind. So now we're stepping away from the broker and you're becoming first of mind for the consumer as well. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, one of the one of the bigger areas that, again, I saw this a lot in 2008, nine and 10. And in some of our markets, I expect in 21, 21 and 22 to start seeing this more. And that's having bank owned properties or vacant properties where there's no utilities on. And it is, it's, it's very hard for buyers and brokers to feel like we've done a really thorough job of investigating it when you guys can't test the services. So if there's a mechanism that you guys have, and I've had a few inspectors where they've come through and they've been able to do pressurized testing for the water systems and the gas systems, or they brought in generators to go and test some of the, the electrical systems. And again, this is where you guys need to look at your, in your state or your community, where those liabilities fall. And if it's something that you can and can't do, but from a buyer's perspective to know that those systems and services have been tested makes them feel a lot better. And we found a lot of issues of cracked water lines and things like that because of the pressure tests that we would have missed otherwise. And so you guys, again, can do a, be heroes in the eyes of the buyers when we're going through and doing that. Uh, again, doing drone work, um, it, is it an expensive tool? Yeah, you're looking at a couple grand for a decent drone um, as well as taking the time to get your FAA certification. And I'm gonna say that second part again. If you're using drones and you don't have the FAA certification, you are creating liability for everybody in the transaction that's using that from a commercial aspect. So please take the time to go and get that. And I would even say, go through that. The InterNACHI has a class to get certified to do that. Go through the class, take your test, and then do additional coursework to actually learn like what are things we can look for? How can I leverage that tool? What can I do with the drone to enhance where I'm at? There are things that we see with like discoloration in the grass or, um, so it's not just for roof inspections. You can actually see things on the whole property that might've been missed when you're at ground level, when you're looking at it from the drone. Uh, again, I've already talked about doing the IR walkthrough. I know a lot of you guys do that. A lot of you guys don't. So if you folks can really start looking at doing an add-on saying, would you like me to do a 10 minute walkthrough? Here's things that we sometimes see and then simply uploading that or, or being able to point out and say, here's what I found in this area. You know, like this window seems to have heat loss. It looks like you have different levels of, of, of uh, insulation R factor in the ceilings in these areas. You might wanna consider having somebody come in and do more blown insulation. Um, again, all of those things can be helpful for the homeowner when they're, when they're doing it afterwards. Uh, getting certified for testing. And again, there's a huge difference between testing and mitigating. I, I really, really like when the inspectors that we work with are qualified to do testing. So the more that you guys have that capacity, the more I'm gonna bring you in, the more you're gonna stay on that list because that means that you can cover a broader spectrum of services that my buyers need. So, um, and again, we've talked about this before. If you are gonna provide resources for contractors, do it with no bias or be very clear that you're involved in the company that does that. And again, a lot of states restrict it uh, they restrict it for a reason, and, and I, I think that that's probably not a bad thing. 
So looking at the social media aspect for you guys, you can see I just pulled this up last night. Uh, as of January 2020, these are all of the different social media sites that people are using as a whole. Facebook is still the largest, and then Instagram and Twitter still have very large followings, but we're seeing TikTok and Snapchat and some of the other ones that are coming through and, and they're, they're getting a larger base. I know there's a lot of thoughts around like who owns them, what countries that just, I'm, I'm, we're not gonna get in that part of the conversation. I'm simply focusing on the fact that different generations use different aspects of social media, who you're targeting can make a big difference based on the platforms that you use. And I would actually recommend leveraging a service to where you can upload something once and have it get pushed out to uh, multiple different areas of, of having that done. Is that, um, Ray, when you say, is that general usage or is that specific to home buyer? Are you talking about the list here? This, is, this list is for all social media in the United States, if that's what you're looking for, for general usage, not just for home buyers. So, um, but again, if you guys can use a, um, a, a list server or something like that to actually push your stuff out there, then you can create one piece of content on your Facebook Live and have it go to your Instagram, have it go to your TikTok, have it go to your YouTube channel and push out to all of those um, at, one, at one time. So I think that that's a really effective way of doing it. Um, but I want you guys to really remember, especially as we're shifting more into this hands-off virtual world, leveraging social media in your marketing is gonna be that much more important um, just again, especially for this next year where social distancing, a lot of offices aren't open. You don't have the ability of getting in front of the realtor boards to do education, coming into the, into the offices to do education. So how can you do that? Get a contact list for the office. Ask if you can do a Zoom training for the office. So don't stop getting in front of people. Change what your system is and do exactly what we're doing on right now. Jump on Zoom, go on... Um, Google Meetups or, or Google Classroom and find some kind of platform that you like. Um, there's a, a, a new service that's getting ready to come, come out called mm -hmm, and it's M-M-H-M-M, -M -M, mm -hmm. and it's a really cool platform that I wish we could have used today. I just couldn't leverage it to, to be able to come out here, but in that system, what you guys can do is you can actually interact with it to where you have you still on the screen along with the background picture, so if you have a picture or a video of what you're showing of what the defect is, you can actually speak to and point it out rather than just the picture with the arrow and a little summary, you can actually walk through it and say, here's where the problem is and here's what we need to address and fix. So. Um, and John, really quick, I have a question here that was sent in from James about your slide. Um, LinkedIn is not used? LinkedIn is used and it's great for professional aspects. Um, I haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. I'm simply showing you these are the top 10 downloaded apps um, in, in the first quarter of 2020. So that's all I was showing you. So this isn't saying that it's not used. This is simply looking at what were the most added or most downloaded social media sites that we, that we have. Um, I'm gonna get to another slide in just a second to look at that. Uh, real quick, let me just get to David's question. Um, inspection reports and over-reporting inspector and new authors with says they do not over-report, make inspection, create a promise. He says he does not take photos unless there's a defect. I see the point in that he says, uh, his summary is 15 pages for report as four to 50 on the alternate end of the spectrum. I know inspectors do 30 page with a hundred page report. Um, so uh, yeah, on, on that side, I do think that that more is better. I think if you guys have a breakdown in some of your systems, so if you're using um, Spectra or some of the different services in your summaries, it can actually break down in the summary um, low, medium, and high, um, you know, maintenance versus defect. So there's the ability of you guys being able to break those down and have a 5, 10, 15 page summary. I do like a much more detailed report to follow up with that. So um, I'm, I'm not afraid of the longer reports. Uh, and if you're doing a good summary, and, and again, a part of it is education, educating the brokers that your, your detail is not to scare the buyers away, but to make sure that they have a really good understanding of what they're getting into to avoid future liability. And if you really reinforce those words, that's going to build the biggest aspect. Um, what was the last social media you suggested where you can show the picture? Uh, mm -hmm, M -M -M. And it's, it's in beta testing right now. 
Uh, if you look it up, um, if you guys use Mac, it's it's readily available for Mac. It's not on PC, which is why I couldn't use it today. They're getting ready to, to put that on on PC. Um, but that's that's a really good tool. If you guys do have, or if you use YouTube, um, and, and this is something that you can learn from Ben. Ben uh, does a great job of incorporating the pictures behind him. Thanks, Brian. Um, ben does a great job of incorporating the pictures and, and walking through it that way. But that's also why when you're on site, and you have the gimbal or if you have your stuff and you, you can actually record yourself doing the virtual summary um, and walking through and saying, right here's where the issue is. Or if you listen to the sound and have a really good microphone, and I'll tell you, a lot of phones when you're five feet away or your iPad does not have a great microphone. Um, but so if you want somebody to hear a sound, a grinding of bearings or something like that, get a good microphone, get close in. Um, and that's another really effective way of doing it. I will say when you're looking at things like that or showing defects, don't post videos of properties that are still in the inspection process and that are going through it where the home can be easily identified. Don't do that. If you want to do things inside the home or show where there's defects in the home as educational modules or tools for brokers and consumers and things like that, that's great. Um, but but don't, don't create problems for the people that goes out in, in the public. Um, Prezi is a good one. Um, there, yeah, there's several different ones that you guys can use where you can overlay uh, Zoom into it. So looking at this again, these are, these are some of the top 100 apps that we have. Now, I want you guys to see as you're going through here, there's Twitter, there's Snapchat. So again, a lot of clients and especially younger clients, they have things on Snapchat. So you can, you can send over a link and do it that way. Facebook Live is a great tool. Um, are you using... Dropbox? Do you have a Google Drive? Do you have something like that? Because a lot of folks are going to need to have access to a link. They won't have the ability of downloading all of your videos because in a lot of rural areas, they don't have the broadband to do it or the storage to do it. So if you have the ability of storing that stuff in the cloud, then it makes it a lot easier for your consumers as well as to send off to uh, the next folks that are out there. Um, there's also um, uh, blog sites, so Tumblr, MeWe, things like that, where you can go in and you guys can actually do inspection blogs and talk about things that are going on and really see what you can do to leverage and build up your business. That's, uh, those are really important ones. And then you guys might also want to think about alternate payment sources. So if you have the ability of having Cash App or Venmo or other areas, I, I'm having a lot of my consumers, especially the, the younger consumers, first-time homeowners, things like that where they're tracking all of their stuff, not through a bank, but through an online payment portal. So if you guys are able to have that tied to your business account and receive funds differently, it might help you guys to get paid a lot quicker and have a different way of tracking how you're being paid. Uh, so Luke, I use some social media in day, day life, but during business hours, I do not as a realtor. Can you talk about your experience of using social media during your business hours? Um, so for, for me personally, um, I, I don't do as much during business hours because for me to take pictures or have videos inside of properties, I have to have permission from the homeowner, um, especially if I'm seeing the interior of the home where they have their personal belongings um, and things like that. So, and it also creates a representation issue on our ethical guidelines as to am I representing and marketing the property. If you guys are up in an attic or if you're showing uh, an enclosed clip of something on a roof where you can't really see the property and you're looking at simply just the defect, that's a different part of that. And so if you're out on an inspection, you come across something that you think, hey, this might be good for a lot of people to see. You know, like here's, here's where a downspout wasn't doing a good job of pushing water away and we can see where the water penetrated inside and like take a little clip of that and post it because that's something that homeowners, they can see, oh, there is a value not just to gutters, but to Frenching in a way or why it's important to deal with moisture issues. Moisture or water settling by property is probably one of the biggest areas that we see in our area because we have so much clay and caliche. So with our expansive soils, that's a major problem for us um, in, in here in the Southwest. So um, do agents like or dislike when inspectors offer repair estimate services? A lot of brokers like it. A lot of brokers don't like it because it creates the perception of bias. Um, and where you're gonna have issues is if that estimate of service wasn't accurate, you will lose that customer. So you need to make sure that if you're using those services that it's really, really accurate and, and on spot with it. So um, another part of it is what is your response time? If you guys can have an automated responder or again, uh, you know, phone, 
phone calls and checking voicemails, it's really, really hard to go through 30 voicemails after you've done a 40 hour inspection. I, I get that. So having somebody else or a person on your team that can go through there or being able to set up your system to where it automates, like for my voicemail, I have my voicemail come to me in a text. So that way I have the ability of reading through it without having to go through all my voicemails and I can delete them as I go. And then I can send a text response back to the consumers that I'm working with. So I get a much faster turnaround because as soon as I finish my showing or my class or I'm on break, I can respond without having to spend 30 minutes going through all of my voicemails for that time frame. So, but your response time is really, really key. A lot of the consumers that I work with, again, we're in a day, uh, we're in an age of immediacy. So whether it's the buyer, the seller, the broker, whoever is reaching out to you, unfortunately, if I get your voicemail, um, and for a lot of cases, if, if, if you're just like one of three and I don't have that relationship, um, they're calling the next one. And, and again, how long out, how pushed out you are, that's a tough one. The, the inspectors I know that have better reputations, they're booked out a lot further, which means that sometimes if my buyer wants to get somebody in, it's somebody I don't know, I haven't worked with, they're finding them online. Um, sometimes, they're, sometimes they're great inspectors, sometimes they're not great inspectors, but you know, that, that's just a, a big part of it. So you know, maybe what you guys are doing to see it, and this is when you're looking at your business development classes, how can you build your business? How can you bring other people in? What can you do to not get booked out or to feel like you have to take everything on so you can leverage more business for yourselves as well. But that response time, both in how quick you get back to the person who called you, as well as how far you, how far out you are for your booking, both are going to be some pretty key factors in what you've got going on. So again, I think this is the key part. Reputation flows. And if I'm on, or if you're on my list and I send you and problems come up because of the inspection, you've not just lost a client, I've lost a client and I've probably lost 10 clients because when I look at when I do business, I'm always hoping that with that consumer, I'm going to generate five to 10 other people for my business over the next five years. So if we miss something and if we miss something on the inspection side that we're not moving forward with, I'm losing that consumer too. So we're, we really are in this together and, it, and it's very, very symbiotic as to how we go through there. So um, right now we've got about 15 minutes left. So I want to open this up for some other questions for you guys or go back and make sure that we've caught the questions that we've missed. So any advice on how to get in a broker agent's recommended shortlist when they already have several trusted inspectors? Um, Sometimes taking a little bit of a hit on that first inspection and saying, hey, if you'll do this for your first one, I'll give your consumer, um, you know, $100 off or $100 gift card. Money talks. That, that's, that's definitely one of those aspects. Um, maybe work with them. And some of the things I've talked about, work with that broker and offer them to come out and say, look, you know, this is a service I provide. I'm happy to come through your property to help you like look at deferred maintenance issues and give you a summary report because then that's definitely getting you into the relationship with that person. Uh, and, and I know that it's really hard to believe that it has much, this much of an impact, but the inspectors that I use um, are also the ones that I see using the more current tools and they're showing those tools off on social media. I follow a lot of different people and when I see something that comes up from, from an inspector, I'm usually watching those videos. Most of us as brokers are, and I'm looking to see, is this something that I should send off to my people or am I going to share it on my Facebook page um, or my YouTube page? And again, and the more that I'm using your tools, the more of a resource that you are for me uh, and, and you're, you're getting out in front of my clients. So I, you might not even have been an inspector I've ever used, but if you say, hey, you know, I'm going to follow you on Facebook, will you follow me back? Or hey, I did this video. I just wanted you to take a look at it to see what you think because I want to see if this kind of content would be useful for your clients. You send it to me once. I think it's kind of cool. I follow you. And suddenly we have that, that, that rapport going back and forth. And now I'm actually marketing for you. I'm sending your videos and your content off to other people, including brokers in my office or brokers in other offices, because what you're sharing is really helpful. But again, we have to learn to leverage these tools. And, and how we're going through here. And you guys shifting over and having good quality video, good quality photos, using gimbals, using the virtual side of it. That for me right now is gonna be really, really huge in our market and our system today. So I think 
this has forced us into changing what we do to where we actually have a better use of our tools and technology going forward. So um, I know that I, again, I, I went really, really fast. So I wanna be sure that we have time to go back and readdress a lot of these aspects. So uh, let's kind of go through the questions. What's your expected time frame for a home inspector to inspect a 1500? Uh, well, so yeah, Julie, I, I agree. I think that condos in theory would take less time. However, um, having the inspectors also go through and check some of the services outside of the condo for the things that service it, that's saved some of my buyers from getting in situations where they didn't realize that the boiler for the condo or for the building um, or maintenance for the outside of the structure was in need of repair. That that actually ended up leading to um, association assessments or like a $10,000 assessment. And I've had my buyers avoid that because the inspector did a, did a good job of actually pointing out things beyond the inside of the condo. Uh, so as far as the time frame goes, um, I, I, again, I, I'm, yeah, this is such a struggle. I just, I just saw another inspector who posted some frustration because they had a seller who said, you can be here at 515, you have one hour, I have a 3000 square foot house. And I realize that that's the market that we work in. That is a situation where I would probably call the listing broker back and say, hey, I just want you and your seller to be aware that if there's things that I miss in being able to present to the buyer, that the seller also may have forgotten to put on their property disclosure form, your seller may be liable for that because it didn't allow for adequate discovery of the property for the buyer as a part of their due diligence period. I just wanna make sure that your seller is okay with taking on that future liability. If you can learn to say that very confidently and comfortably, you'll start to find sellers being a lot more open to you doing a good job because they don't wanna be on the hook for things that you missed that the buyer felt that they should have known and disclosed. So when it comes to the time frame for the home, I'm less concerned about how long it takes you to do the job in the home. Like if you're there, and I need to have somebody be there with you for two or three hours to do a really, or four hours or five hours to do a really good job. Just do a really good job, right? Just focus on that. So what else? Who's next? Let's see, it looks like we do have a question about, um, from John, could I offer promo codes for a furniture store where I make commission off of those sales? So again, anytime that you guys are receiving a secondary benefit, I think that needs to be disclosed. Um, if you're an InterNACHI member, you might need to go through and read your code of ethics. I, I, I'll be honest, I don't remember. I haven't read through years in a while um, to see if those kinds of secondary benefits fall within or outside of what you guys have in your COE, your code of ethics. I know for us, I can't do that. We're, we're, I'm legally not, not allowed to do that in most states. And as a realtor member, that's something that unless I disclose to my consumer that I'm going to get a financial benefit from, I can't do that without the consumer's permission um, either. Uh, so uh, John, John Hogg had a question. What, um, my opinion on transaction brokers and uh, differentiation with buyer's agents. When it comes to handling the inspection, uh, I honestly don't think there's much of a difference. I do... In New Mexico, I probably do 95% of my work as a transaction broker. In Colorado, I probably do 70, 60, 70% of my work as a transaction broker. When I'm doing uh, larger ranches or um, you know larger commercial projects, I may step more into an agent conversation, um, and that's and that's more based on some of the the conversations that we have. But I think in a general residential setting, they're really sh probably I like I can't think of a lot of difference where. The, the transaction broker or the agent is going to have a big difference in conversation because our job is to provide the information to the client to discuss what we have actual knowledge of. And that's where my key thing is, is I don't think a lot of agents have actual knowledge of what's causing these things until we get further investigation. And so when they're shooting from the hip and speaking to that, I, I think they're kind of talking out of their butt a little bit and they're creating liability for everybody. Um, but I also want to clarify Every state clarifies and has a different relationship of what an agent is versus what a transaction broker is. So how we handle it in Colorado or New Mexico is very different than how we handle it in Texas and South Dakota uh, and, and other states. And a lot of states don't even have transaction brokers. Uh, so again, that's, that's, that's going to be a very different question as you go state to state. What can you say to a listing agent to ensure that the seller is not present? Um, <laughs> 
Unfortunately, there's times where I can't ensure that the that the seller is not going to be present. Um, the one thing that I I pass on to my sellers is uh, one I don't like them being there when buyers are there because if they say something that could be construed as an agreement, then we get into an issue of potential fraud or misunderstanding. When it comes to the inspector being there, especially when they're following you around, I would simply tell them, look, you know, if the seller is there. Please make sure that that you know they're they're not following me around or pointing things out because if I get distracted and miss something that the buyer assumes that the seller had knowledge of or it creates a perception that the seller was trying to distract me, it could create liability on your seller for anything that gets missed. And the other part of it is um, you can also say it's like, and I don't know if your seller wants to interact with me as an inspector because if I give them knowledge, then they have knowledge for me that creates a potential disclosure issue for them in the future. So you can put it in that liability and risk avoidance so that the sellers just don't want to interact with you uh, to make sure that that's a little bit better. Uh, do you prefer a phone call, email, direct message? Um, so when you're reaching, so uh, the question about reaching out to agents, um, phone calls are tough, uh, again, especially in, the, in, in, in how we are right now, because a lot of us, if we're with other people, we're not going to step away from the folks we're with for a phone call. Um, I think a text is fine if you guys aren't using a system like BombBomb. Uh, that's just one video email system where you can do a quick video and say, hey, this is John. You know, I'm an inspecting area we haven't met with. I just wanted to connect with you really fast. It comes up on my email. It's a, you know, a 30, 45 second video clip of you. It's personalized to me. That's a really great uh, tool to use. So that way I see you. I, you know, I'm hearing you. Again, there's some direct interaction. So I think BombBomb is a, is a really great way. Um, I, and I don't have a problem. I have a lot of folks who reach out on me and instant message and things like that. Um, I'll be honest with you on some sites like LinkedIn or, or Facebook. Um, I, and I have a lot of professional contacts in those areas. But if I friend you and your very first communication with me is, is I don't know, like I said, this is a tough one. If your first communication with me is, hey, I want to help you learn how you can do something better with your business, I'll, I'll be blunt. I just, I dismiss a lot of those and I might be missing great opportunities, but I just dismiss a lot of those. Introduce yourself, build the rapport, have the connection, and then start walking through those aspects because if it, otherwise you haven't shown me why you deserve my listening to you if you jump right out into that. So um, can you address ideas for beginners to get your foot in the door? Uh, yeah. Get a lot of knowledge, get a lot of information, get a lot of certifications. When you're walking out there and talking to brokers for the first time, make sure that we understand the level of knowledge and the tools that you're bringing. And again, when you're out there, ask them a question. How many of the inspectors actually do a walkthrough you know, with, with the infrared? Here's something that, that I found or here's something that I've seen that, that we can do. do. Are your inspectors doing that right now? Again, if you can leverage yourself in offering something to where they're like, wow, I know I hadn't seen that before, or no, the other inspectors I'm working with don't do that, then you've immediately separated yourself off and you've given yourself an opportunity where I'm be like, hey, I'm going to give this person a shot to come in and do this. So again, what are you doing to separate yourself off uh, is going to be one of the big things. Uh, how does dual agency affect the broker's relationships with the inspector, if at all? So Ray, when it comes to dual agents, this is always a question in a lot of states and and in a lot of states they actually have eliminated the actual dual agency aspect of fiduciary where i should be giving my opinion to sway one side or the other as a dual agent because i can't do that i can't be a fiduciary to both sides of the transaction at once as a broker and so in a lot of states they will actually become a facilitator or transaction broker and they have different names for it in different states and at that point i should be providing equal information to both sides However, in that note, if I am working with both sides, and again, this is where it comes down to, if you simply provide the information to the buyer and not the broker, then you've cut off that, that obligation where I, as the listing broker, if the deal falls through, would then have to pass on the information I have to the seller. So if you guys will stop sending information to us unless it is requested, and again, have the conversation. Hey, John, you know, when I'm doing this, I always send my information to the buyers. I don't know if you want me to send it to you as well, because it might create, you know, an obligation for knowledge or disclosure or potential issues for you if you have this. And it's not something that should ever be passed on to the listing side or to the seller without my permission. Engage in the conversation. Explain to us why 
it's not our job to go through the whole inspection um, so that we can do a better job for our clients. Again, this is where, where we're looking for you guys. We as brokers don't understand truly what it is you guys do. Um, I, you know, this, this conversation I'm having with you is not the norm. A lot of brokers just don't understand what the tool is and how it's supposed to be effectively be used. So please help us do a better job by you stepping in and, and educating us. Uh, what's the best way to reach out to brokers these days? Most offices don't want visitors because of COVID. Phone calls don't work. Again, same thing. The more that you can put yourself out there and have um, your social media aspects and, and even asking, what are the best ways to reach out to your brokers? Do you guys have, um, you know, can, can I do a Zoom class for your brokers? Can I get into your office's um, internal Facebook group? Um, that might be a really good way of, le of leveraging it. So learning how the office is communicating internally for their people and you being able to step into that way of communication could be an effective tool for you when you can't be in person with us right now. So uh, maybe misunderstood on my comment in regards to the seller who wants to allow only an hour to inspect. Are you suggesting the inspector? Um, so in that case, if the seller is saying you only have an hour, again, you're being hired by the buyer works with the buyer broker. Um, I have no problem if you come to me and say, look, for a property like this, I need three hours to, to do a good job. And if I miss something, again, educate me as the buyer broker. And if I miss something that the buyer assumes that the seller had knowledge of that could create liability, I am then going to call the, the listing broker and say, hey, you know, the inspector is saying that for this size of a house to do, the, to do a really good job, they need at least three hours. They need at least four hours. And so on the buyer side, I just wanna make sure is your seller saying that my buyer can't get the level of investigation that they were allowed per the contract? And this is where, again, broker to broker, let us do that job. I can go to them and say, the buyer has the right to inspect the property to whatever level is allowed by the contract. And if your seller is gonna interfere with that, that might be considered bad faith. Now, again, in a seller's market where they have 10 backup offers or whatever, that can, that can be a much more difficult conversation but I have found very effective ways of getting to the listing broker then to the seller to say, if the inspector isn't afforded the time to find things, then we're assuming that whatever they don't find is going to be disclosed from the seller and that your seller is okay being on the hook for it in the future. I just want to clarify that. And then what happens is they see that liability on the other side. I haven't had to be mean or schmuck about it. Um, I'm simply laying out what the facts are for liability. And that typically opens the door for me to be able to go in. What kind of discovery questions do you suggest I ask the brokers to uncover opportunities for me to do, differentiate better and align with their value propositions to the clients? Um, again, a lot of what we've talked about today, and again, different market, different services, people offer different things. If you go back to the slide where I said, these are things that most inspectors are not offering as a, as a general tool. Um, so again, the drone, um, using IR for something beyond looking at the electric panel, um, you know, doing things like that, walking through, and if you're using, um, you know, thermostats to check water temperatures or whatever, I mean, you, you can talk about little different things that you do as an everyday part of your inspections that we're gonna be like, Ooh, that's cool. And, and just, you know, kind of bring it out there. Um, so that we can do that. And if you're educating the people on using those tools, uh, then, and again, if you're educating us on what those different tools do, then when we're speaking to our consumers, I get to sound like I'm really smart by going back to my buyer and saying, hey, when you use this inspector, these are the five or six things that I know that they do. And these are the tools that they use. And these are what they're certified to do and test for. Well, John, what about the other two inspectors? I don't know. Why do I not know? Because they never took the time to let me know what they do that's different. And so when I'm having the conversation, it makes it really easy for me to separate one person out, even if it's inadvertently, because I simply know more about you and what you do. So again, that rapport and those services become really key. Uh, so Phyllis, how do you spell what? Which, which one are you talking about? If you can just re-clarify that and I'll try to find it again. Um, and is an assumption the inspector is liable for whomever is at the property time of the inspection? So Julie, this is a tricky question. Um, in most states, whoever lets the person in is the person that's responsible for whatever happens. So in most areas, that's gonna be the broker. And so, you know, but if the inspector allows the buyer to come through and do a walkthrough, and that wasn't, um, the permission wasn't given from the listing broker and or the seller, 
you as the inspector do become liable for the buyer that's in the property. That's why in a lot of states, they require a licensee, which if you're a licensed inspector, then you have the bonding, you have the insurance, and in a lot of cases, you have the access to lockbox key. And then yes, you are then liable for whoever you let into the home. So in most cases, you know, for a lot of brokers, we're still going to show up when the buyers are there, again, not to engage in the conversation with you. And if the, and, and if the broker is engaging, pull them aside, let them know that, you know, hey, it's like I've, I've done some classes with, with some other brokers and I want to make sure that the client's really getting this information. And then you guys can talk about it after the fact. But that way, I know that I've covered all the bases I need to cover with them. And then you can, you know, have whatever conversations that you want to have with them. So, uh, all right, we have time for about one more question and then we're going to wrap things up. Okay, let me just scroll through here really quick. So, uh, real quick, I don't, different markets have different access for super. So, so David, on yours, that's going to depend on the market. That's not something I can really talk to on a, on a national level. Um, and Russell, I can hang out for a little bit longer if you want, so I can answer a question. There are better ways to discover feature preaching. I want to build a business case for broker work with me, especially. Um, yeah, so again, this and this will also go back to the person who said, what are the top three things that, oh, bomb, bomb, uh, B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B. So it's an online thing. Um, the, the top three things, which I think Russell will also go to yours, um, those discovery questions, the better tools you have, the more you're going to find. And again, we need to all work together to educate brokers to say, your job is not to scare the buyer away, but your job is to make sure that you have an informed buyer who knows everything that's going on. And the best way to do that is to have really effective tools. So like I've already said, I know I'm kind of harping this, and some of you guys use this as a tool, so you're probably rolling your eyes at me right now, but most inspectors are not doing IR around the property. They're simply taking a still picture of certain things. They're not doing the walkthroughs. Most inspectors are not using drones for their videos. Um, a lot of them are not using video summaries. So those three things right there will separate you out from most inspectors that I work with and that I, and that I deal with around the country. And that's also gonna help you do a better job of discovery, which honestly protects the buyer. It gives them better information and it protects the sellers because the buyers are coming in more informed, which means they have less to come back after the seller with in the future. Um, so uh, yeah, and real quick on the COVID side, refuse to use this because we require masks for COVID and yet it is. Um, always go back to your public health code. If you can go by that and stand by what you've got to do for safety, um, that's a part of it. And, and I agree, you may lose business because that's a part of what it is. As a broker, I'm always enforcing it. So in our state, we have to have masks and gloves. If I have a buyer who um, is refusing to do that, then I can't let them into the home and I'll offer to let them sit outside and I do a video walkthrough. So um, it's time you guys need to, to get going. I'll hang out and keep answering questions in the chat. Uh, Jasmine and all of you guys, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to uh, visit with you guys, share some of our perspectives as brokers. Um, this, is, this is, I think my third or fourth year of, of meeting with you guys and the conversation changes every year. So I definitely appreciate being invited back. Um, and you have my contact information in the bio. So if you have questions or if you want to reach out to me separately, I'm always happy to work with inspectors around the country to give you guys ideas on what you can do one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, thank you guys very much for being a part of this today and enjoy the rest of the conference.